Jonathan. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to present the joint work with Alex Aninde and Herman, who are all my collaborators from MDA Software Institute. So how do we specify a correct behavior of a concurrent library? If you ask a concurrency expert, the answer will be, well, use linear visibility. Because it's a very well-known and well-established correctness condition, described in early 90s and used quite successfully since then in specification and verification communities. And the success of linearizability is because of its conceptual simplicity. So what linearizability does is it describes the behavior of a concurrent library. In terms of a behavior of a sequential library, essentially saying that if we have non-overlapping method calls to made to a concurrent object, then we can think really of them as sequential calls and reason of a concurrent object as we would reason about a sequential object. So far, so good. Well, unfortunately, linearizability comes with an issue, and this is a per performance issue. So uh, this is a fairly recent result from Popo 2010, saying that if we want to implement a correct linearizable concurrent object, we uh, unavoidably need to rely on some expensive synchronization primitives, such as compare and swap. And this is a reason why we cannot really take full advantage of parallelism. So how do we take that advantage of parallelism? And the recent suggestions made by the giants of the concurrency community were, well, let's just drop linearizability because it's very strong correctness condition, but it's also uh, the one which requires the synchronization primitives. And in fact, we can implement something far more efficient if we relax our specification and use something else instead of linearizability, but very much in this spirit. And this was the call for ARMS, which resulted in a whole bunch of correctness conditions being developed over the last couple of decades, but most of them were developed quite recently, uh, as a substitute for linearizability. And essentially, every single correctness condition from this batch has been developed on an example on, a, uh, on an example base, so in order to specify one example or one specific class of examples. And indeed, this is all good as long as you're publishing papers, but this diversity comes with a challenge, actually the whole three of them. So first of all, the proliferation of these correctness conditions makes it quite difficult to compose them. So one nice thing about linearizability is that if you take two linearizable libraries and you build a library out of them, then it's still linearizable. That doesn't quite work if your constituents actually adhere to different correctness conditions, and it's tricky to say what to do about their composition. So now we don't really have the nice compositional reasoning method. The second issue is the lack of nice verification methodology. So linearizability comes with a very well understood verification method, which is linearization points. It's very syntactical, it's very graphical, and it's quite pleasant to use. And none of such methods are developed for any of the correctness criteria that I have mentioned. So the last problem is what we call uniformity. Uh, and this is related to reason about the client applications of those concurrent libraries. Because the correctness condition tells you how the library sort of behaves in an abstract context. But it doesn't uh, give you a recipe how to plug it into your client code and prove some properties of the code that uses this library. So this work was essentially an attempt to address these three uh, shortcomings of these correctness conditions, but by using a single tool, which we understand quite well. So let me just remind you the title. And the key part of it is about horror style specifications, which probably most of you are very well familiar in this room. So we have a program which is specified by means of some pre and post conditions. And in the case of concurrency, this whore tuple, it also comes with an additional component, usually written in multiple different ways. But you can think of it as an additional context assumptions that specify what invariants of the data structures that the program E manipulates with should hold in the, uh, the multi-threaded context. In other words, there is this still standard there is a standard partial uh, correctness meaning of the whore triple saying that if the program states and uh, st starts in the state sati that satisfies P, and then if ter it terminates, then the final state satisfies the assertion Q, and that is all resilient to the interference manifested by this uh, concurrent context C. All right, so the nice thing about horror style specification that they satisfy exactly these three conditions that we want to deliver. So first of all, they are compositional, because if you give horror style specifications to the programs, you automatically have substitution principle. As long as a program satisfies this specification, it's good for you to use, and you can plug any other instead of it. It also comes with syntactic method, which might be exercised by a proof assistant. That is by means of inference rules. So the logics, they 
come with the ways to enforce specifications in them. And finally, these specifications are uniform, meaning that there is no this artificial dichotomy between the libraries and the clients. So you just verify programs on top of programs by means of plugin specifications. And this was the terminology we used, but if you're more comfortable with something you've seen this morning, this means that this specification are rich, live, uh, and two-sided. <laughs> and indeed, they are formal, but this is kind of obvious, so I didn't mention it here. All right, so as I said, this work was essentially very large case, stu case studies of us trying to apply the horse style specific specification approach to three different but quite representative correctness conditions, such that recently developed concurrency aware learnability, quantitative quiescent consistency, and somewhat more traditional quiescent consistency. So in this talk, I'm going to give a short example which shows how the horse style specifications allow one to capture the quiescent consistency condition. And roughly, quiescent consistency means that uh, an object, a concurrent object, behaves like a sequential one, but under somewhat more restricted conditions, given that two calls, they have no other pending calls in between them. And then these two calls exhibit their results in the natural sequential order. And if you wonder why this correctness condition might appear, well, here's a very simple example which comes from the solving uh, probably the most basic problem in uh, concurrent, uh, concurrent reasoning. And this uh, problem, uh, sorry, con concurrent implementations. And this problem is implementation of a concurrent counter. So we want to have this simple data structure which has just one method that gives us some natural value and increases this value internally by one. So the next thread coming will get the next value. So this is quite useful for emitting unique indices, and you can probably imagine the whole bunch of applications. So and if I ask you to implement uh, this procedure in a fine-grained manner, that is, without using synchronized primitives or logs, the code will be somewhat like this. So this is what is happening. Assuming x is the pointer that stores the value of our counter, what the thread tries to do is do the compare and swap operation by installing the next the incremented value into this uh, into this uh, memory cell, and if it succeeds in doing so, that means that the value has been successfully installed and can be just returned. Otherwise, the whole procedure repeats recursively. Well, as discussed, the problem with this procedure, which is quite good and indeed it is correct, that we have this performance bottleneck show, uh, showed by the compare and swap instruction, and this is the point of the program which many threads will be trying to execute, and most of them will be failing in the in the presence of a high content. Okay, so the way to relax it a little bit, still relying on sort of comparing swap primitives, but using them in somewhat more uh, distributed way, is to split the workload of threads, and instead of having one cast, have two of them, but each one will have just the half of the load. And this is the idea of a counting network. So this is the most simple counting network you can imagine. So now, instead of one pointer for the counter, we have three pointers. So one pointer will be storing the even values of the counter. And another one is going to be storing the odd values of the counter. And in order for the thread to decide which counter it goes to, uh, is going to increment, we are going to use this additional Boolean pointer called the balancer. So another word you might hear for a counting network is balancing trees, because this structure can be very well made hierarchical and having as many uh, counters as you want, therefore splitting the workload between the threads. So this is how it works. Whenever a thread wants to increment, it first checks in with the balancer by performing this flip operation, which returns the current value and changes it to the opposite. So for example, the value was zero, and the thread goes and then increments the counter number zero, bumping its value by two, hence it stores only even values. Otherwise, it goes to the odd counter and changes its value by two again, therefore storing a new uh, odd value. So, and this works amazingly well if we are in a sequential setting. So, assume we have just one thread, and this is what is going to happen. So, the thread comes and checks in with the balancer, gets in zero, and says, okay, let's go and increment the counter zero for the even value. So, the counter is being bumped up by two, and the, the result of the whole operation is zero, which was the actual value of the counter. So, the next thread, which will be incremented this counter, will get the value two. But since the uh, value of the balancer has been changed, if this very same thread calls this procedure again, what he'll get is the balancer being one and the result being one. So we got the first result zero, the second result is one, so far so good, all the results are exhibited in the natural sequential order. Well, the situation might change drastically if we have concurrency. So the same first thread comes in and checks with the balancer. And then the other thread appears. And while the first thread is suspended, the second goes on and increments the counter for the even uh, for the odd values. And then proceeding, it calls the procedure again, gets the balancer zero, and the result zero. Clearly, there is something wrong here. So from the perspective of this blue thread, 
it should have got the results in the natural order, except that he didn't. And the reason for that, that there was this pending call from the red thread, which never terminated during the execution of the blue thread. And this is what essentially screwed the execution of the blue one. Yet, this is the data structure which we are willing to use. But what we want to know is what kind of guarantees we can get out of using this one. So clearly, we cannot implement something which gives us strictly increasing sequence of indices in every single thread because of this interference phenomenon. So we need to go, to go for something else. So what would be the optimal correctness condition for this sort of data structure. So let's uh, see. So uh, clearly, we cannot expect the uh, values of the counters coming in the natural order, as has been just demonstrated. So instead, we replace it by somewhat more weak, like these three correctness conditions. I'm going to talk only about two of them. So first of all, since we are likely to use this counter for emitting unique indices, we need to make sure that different calls return distinct values, but not necessarily in the increasing order. And second, the two calls separated by the period when we have no interference should take effect in their sequential order. So this is, might be something essential if you're implementing, for example, a relaxed algorithms, something like solving a discrete event simulation. So this is quite common in that community. So uh, before we proceed with the formal specification, let's make a couple of observations about the counter networks. First of all, every, every flip of the balancer essentially gives it permission for a thread to go and increment the appropriate counter. And second, each of the counters was changing continuously, storing the even and the odd values correspondently. And luckily, these two programming patterns are quite well understood in the concurrency logic community and have names to capture them. So the first one is called permissions or tokens. And the second is called update capturing history. So those are typically logical notions which are attached to the specification in order to make sense out of what is happening. So this was known. What was not known is how to combine these two notions in order to get specified something that like, like a counting network in the spirit of quiescent consistency. So as I said, these tokens and histories, they are fictitious notions, or what's in the, in the logic jargon is called the auxiliary state, which serves purely for specification, but is not being instructed and doesn't quite affect, doesn't affect the performance whatsoever. So when we talk about the auxiliary state, by real state, we mean the actual heap, which implements the data structure, <laughs> such as these three pointers that we have here. And the auxiliary state is going to be this ad, uh, fictional uh, splitable resource, so it should be uh, possible to split this uh, state between between different threads and make sure that threads uh, take separate roles and separate contributions with respect to it. So the token sets, which we are going to denote by tau, are just disjoint sets of something isomorphic to natural numbers, and the histories are partial na maps from natural numbers corresponding to the values we write to the counters to something which is going to be described in a couple of slides. So taking a look at the intermediate snapshot uh, which features all this auxiliary in real state, this is what we have. So here we have four threads which are pending and trying to increment. So they've already got their tokens, and three of them got the tokens for the even value, and one of them got the token for the odd value. That means that in the future history, there are likely to be three more even values appended and one more odd values appended. But the currently, we have this uh, state of the history, 0 and 3. So the next thread to come will likely get the value 3 because, the, because, because of this value of the balancer. So this is what you might think of the histories and the tokens. Except, for the histories that, uh, except that the histories here come with a very simple but very efficient twist. Uh, instead of just uh, capturing the value that has been written to a counter at some point of time, uh, like 0, 1, 2, and etc. They will be also capturing the set of tokens that were dispensed at the, at the, at the same, same time. In other words, the history will uh, informally capture the number of pending calls which were present at the moment this particular value has been written to the history. This is a purely logical thing, and it's unlikely that we will know precisely what these pending calls are. But having a way to get a handle on this and the specification is very useful when we, can specif when we, uh, when we want to say something about the lack or the absence of interference or the presence of, of it. So we are approaching the specification for this data structure, which will be using these four auxiliary variables, the bold highs and non-bold highs, and the same for taus. So the highs specify history of this and all other threads correspondingly. That's the reason why we need this resource to be splittable, so we can think of the history of all other threads as of just one 
additional variable. And the same goes for tokens. So the bold tau will be specifying the token that this thread holds, the one which, we are being, which, which is being specified, and the non-bold tau which will be denoting the all other tokens which possibly held by the interference. So this is a simple program which assigns the result of get an increment to some uh, variable. And we start the specification by saying that initially uh, the set of tokens that this thread holds is empty. And there is this post condition which might look a little bit intimidating, but in fact, it captures precisely what was the effect of this operation. Let's see. So first, it says that the tokens at the end, uh, denoted by this primed variable, are still empty. That means if any tokens were fetched during this operation, they were dispensed in exchange for the contribution to the history. Second thing, it says that the only contribution to the history that this call has made is this entry, which added the value that equals the returned result plus two. And it was pointed to some interference, which we really don't know much about because it's existentially quantified here. So there is this additional constraint, which is essentially a law of token preservation, saying that the tokens get dispensed, but they don't get dropped and they don't appear out of nowhere. And finally, this clause says that whatever was the most uh, the, the largest value in the history right before the call, the result plus two plus two times this uh, summoned is strictly greater than this. So this summon is actually the most important thing here. It essentially says that if we take the interference right before the call, and the interference at the moment when the call actually took the effect and take the intersection, that's going to be the measure of imprecision of this procedure due to the presence of interference. In other words, that if we had no interference when making the call, then this is going to be empty and it's going to be the whole uh, component is going to be zero and we'll get something far more precise, which we will see soon how it works. So in other words, we didn't have even to mention any real state. What we only mentioned here is this abstraction for pending calls, that is tokens, and the abstraction for visible updates, that is history. And that's it. And this specification, which was verified against the actual implementation and the presence of this additional state, is, actually, is going to give us what we uh, seek from the uh, and consistency. So the question is what this specification is good for? Well, let's see. First of all, it's, yeah, thank you. First of all, it's quite trivial to see that uh, given that all entries in the histories are distinct and each entry corresponds to a call result, that means that different calls indeed returns distinct results. So this indeed means that we can use this data structure as a, as a counter for, let's say, generating unique indices. Second is more tricky. So how do we say that two calls separated by a period of quiescence indeed take the did take effect in their sequential order. So I will not give you a general theorem saying that it's like this for any given client because that would mean a very strong statement. But in fact, I can uh, give you sort of a characteristic client for this data structure, which is already uh, high order enough to exhibit the right phenomenon. So here we have two calls to this data structure in parallel with some almost unrestricted interfering program. So this parallel composition essentially means that we run this call in parallel with some program which we really don't know much about. So, and now here we agree to have this quiescent moment, meaning that there are no any other threads running in the context that would interfere with us on this particular counter. And in this setting, our goal is to prove that the result one is indeed smaller than the result two, which would be the natural behavior for the counter. And how this specification is going to help us? Well, first of all, let's agree on what we know about this interference. Actually, we need to know very little. So the only thing we need to state is this, this uh, operation, this program, which might as well be concurrent one, does something with the counter, which means it might have some potentially non-empty contribution to the history, but it doesn't hold any tokens at the beginning and at the end. So you can think of it as another batch of calls to the data structure. So now, because we have a substitution principle, assuming this specification, we can simply plug this program into a larger context and derive the specification for the parallel composition, which is very similar to what we had, except for this bit with the history that now says that our history has changed by this contribution, what has been contributed by E1 and what has been contributed by the get and increment call. So far so good. Now let's exercise the compositionality once again and plug the specification into a larger context that now has this two parallel composition. So in the spirit of interactive verification, now we can derive these intermediate assertions just out of the specifications and think of them a little bit. So what exactly do they give us? So the first thing we are going to see that the history has been changed by these two contributions after the first parallel composition and it has been changed even further after the second parallel composition, specifically holding these entries for the first and the second result. Second thing we are going to notice is this constraint on the tokens which are held after, after these two calls have terminated. And as we agreed that there is no internal interference, that means this two components, 
that is threads, uh, that is tokens held by other threads are actually empty at the end. And this gives us a very useful constraint on the interference tau prime, which was, which was uh, happening in between these two calls, which, as we now know, was also empty. Because all interference we got, it was actually concealed within these two parallel compositions. So plugging this result here, we get the desired empty set here that reduces to another empty set, and that gives us zero. So the last bit to realize that this is actually a constraint for the overall history that takes place right here. And this is what this history is like. And even though we don't know most of the parts of it, we know the essential ones. Specifically, we know that this history contains this entry, which is, might, be, might be the last or might be smaller than the last component of the joint history. So if we just take this one and weaken this inequality, we'll get the desired result. And this is it. So uh, essentially, we only needed to have these bits with histories and tokens to define some useful result and reason about the clients. And you can easily imagine how it scales in the presence of many more threads and somewhat similar data structures. So in other words, this specification being quite abstract allowed us to deliver the uh, correctness condition, which is quite similar in the spirit to quiescent consistency, even though we haven't proved the formal theorem, but we had the same reason in principle, which quiescent consistency doesn't you quite give. So the summary of the specification pattern will be as follows. It's indeed very high, high level, and I invite you to take a look at the paper to see more examples, but what you need to figure out is the way to represent the interference that matters by means of something like tokens, then capture this interference use, uh, uh, in the events in auxiliary histories, and finally make some uh, general assumption about what interference you are going to experience, like we had here. And that usually gives you what you need. So in the paper, we have many more things. We have another correctness conditions checked for different data structures. We have a ni very nice example from the Java Util concurrent library, this exchanger, which is not linearizable, but concurrency are linearizable. And we show why it matters for the clients and what you can actually prove about them. And we have implemented all these case studies in the context of the logical framework that we have, which is fine-grained concurrent separation logic uh, implemented on top of Coq. But it, in principle, it might probably have been done in any other fairly expressive modern concurrency logics, such as ICAP and IRIS. All right, so all examples have been implemented in Coq, which the Artifact Evaluation Committee has approved. So this is what I would like you to take away. If you have a crazy concurrent data structure which you are going to plug in your high-performance application and you want to make sense out of it, think of a way to specify in use, using pre and post condition in horse style, because then you get compositionality, you get the uh, out of the box, the proof, the proof method out of the box, and you get the uniform reasoning method for the libraries and for the clients. But make no mistake here, uh, it's not a method which gives you something for free. Even though we got this framework, some, stinking, uh, some thinking will still be involved because you will have to figure out what are the useful components for your specification and what you may want your pre and post conditions to capture. In other words, rephrasing or the good specification is in the eye of the beholder. And this is what I've got. Thank you. Before the questions. If you want to hack some concurrency with code,